No. No buzz. A Jess B's book club. Um, today. Talking about a book that, as of this recording, is unreleased. Uh, Small Fires, an Epic in the Kitchen by Rebe Rebecca May Johnson. Um, I believe this is uh, Johnson's first book published in the U.S. I think that's right. I'm not positive. Um, I obviously read it in an advanced reader copy. <sighs> this might be my favorite book that I've read in 2023 that was published in 2023. Um, the, the pickings are not super... Um, <laughs> that, is a, that is a barren tree in, in many ways. I think, I think I've got five at this point um, in the year. Uh, it's been a, been a year of older books for me, for the most part. Um, um, but also, but weirdly, like a, a, a couple of really decent, like, left food writing books um, between this and Nourishing Resistance. Um, they, um, excuse me, uh, the uh, edited the edited volume um, edited by Ren Arai. Um, uh, both things that I've been looking for for a long time, as I talked about in that video. Um, this again is a video for just bees, just bees book club. Only bees allowed. Only bees allowed. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that is. Only bees allowed. This is nothing. This is nothing. Um, I really like this. Um, I think my high level takeaway is that this is the best uh, in defense of recipes I could imagine in some ways. Maybe not like that I could imagine, but definitely that I've ever actively, like, actually uh, read before. Um, uh, this is a, you know, a sort of a memoir of cooking in some ways. It is a philosophical argument about um, you, you know, women's work uh, and feminized labor specifically about reproductive labor. It is a, um, it is a book about dancing and cooking. Um, it is, uh, <laughs> it is a defensive recipe. It is a defense of cooking by the recipe, um, which is great because I am not that. Um, I, you know, I am among the many people who will say like, oh, if I want to cook something, I will look up, you know, three or four recipes. I'll get a, a sort of general sense of the shape of the thing and I will um, pull those together in the way that makes sense um, according to the rules of my, um, you know, my oven for whatever, you know, for whatever, like knowing, for instance, that, you know, when the, when the preheat light goes on, that's going to be another 10 minutes uh, before it's actually like at that temperature break enough bread to know that um uh you know to, you know i know the way that the the pan or like the uh the stove in my house is tilted just just ever so uh such that oil will pool um sort of nearer to me in the pan um and so things like like following a recipe fundamentally don't make sense to me because i have to be like well the, the if i do two take two teaspoons of oil um, that's and, it, and this is going to take more than like the amount of time it would take a wok to cook, like a stir fry. Um, the the oil is going to pool at the bottom, and so the the, the cooking is going to be uneven. Uh, this takes ten minutes, this takes five minutes even. Um, so for me, recipe writing, which is also a thing I have engaged in, in um, I don't think I was ever particularly good at it, but it was a very fun exercise. Um, uh, and especially recipe reading are are things that I think of as um, you know, sort of guidelines at best, um, and and Rebecca May Johnson in this book does a very good job of saying, maybe fuck you, maybe recipes are really actually incredible, and she does them in a really, really fun way. Um, my favorite moment in reading this book, um, there's a chapter. Uh, chapter do, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six. Chapter six um, starts on page forty-four in the in the arc, at least, uh, called "Hot Red Epic," um, in which uh, Johnson goes back over and over again, sort of recounting uh, little flashpoints along the way of cooking the same recipe a thousand times um, over the course of about a decade or a little bit more, maybe. Um, 
And so she like situate, um, there's also gender stuff in this book. Um, as, as far as I know, Rebecca Mae Johnson uses she, her pronouns. Um, but I'm ha happy to be corrected. <laughs> and maybe, not, I mean, it's complicated. Um, let's just say that to my understanding at this point, Rebecca May Johnson uses she, her pronouns with uh, some complicated feelings about gender as expressed directly in this book um, and about womanhood, especially. Um, sorry, that, that was a thing I should have said earlier. Um, so Johnson goes through and, and cooks this recipe a thousand times over the course of a decade of um, different over different relationships, over different um, jobs, over different, you know, um, moments of capacity of, of uh, understanding of what it is asking for, of, of desires for different flavors. Um, and it's just this extremely compelling thing because it's, I mean, Hot Red Epic gives you a good sense of what it probably is, what this recipe is, but she doesn't say it. The, the recipe itself is not named until like near the end of the chapter. And I think that works really well because because you have a general idea, or because I had a general idea um, from from the text and and from the t the title of the chapter, I was like, but what kind of red sauce is this? Um, and uh, it was it was just really fun to like read through and be like, okay, you're like you're pulling these sorts of things. Uh, like, you know, the amount of garlic here makes it seem like this is probably not like a Sicilian or even Southern Italian dish. Like it might be Northern and then like that going back and forth. Um, and, and then the thing that works extremely well is when, when the reveal happens, right? Um, uh, the text of the tomato sauce recipe that becomes the subject of my epic that I find online on the Guardian website and their fe features on... And their feature on famous chef's favorite recipes is written by Ruth Rogers. She is co-founder and chef at the famous River Cafe restaurant in London. Here's the text of the recipe as I first uh, uh, encountered it. Uh, Best Pasta by Marcella Hazan, nominated by Ruth Rogers. So it's Ruth Rogers interpreting uh, Marcella Hazan's uh, Sugo Fresco di Pomodoro. Uh, and that, that alone was like a really fun moment of like, yeah, I did want to know what the fuck this recipe was. Um, but the reason this book, I think, is my favorite thing I've maybe read in, in 2023, published in 2023, is that um, Johnson immediately goes, like, hold on. So what's Hazan's recipe? Because uh, it's credited to this one book, but it turns out it's not in that book, and it might be in an older book. But that older book... Well, it's actually a collection of older, even than that, books, um, and she and they're all extremely out of print, despite Hazan being a, a name uh, in, in 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 cookbook writing, um, and and it's just like that sort of move, generally speaking, that I that I really appreciated about this book of uh, Johnson, like you know, Johnson doesn't do the simple thing of cooking a red sauce a thousand times over the course of a decade and, and documenting um, instances of it that uh, tell a compelling story. Um, th that would be too simple. Um, that would not be too simple. That's an incredible thing already on its own. The thing is, she then pushes it past that to say, so where is the source text of this actually? Because this is, the, this is one of the questions, like what is the source text of a recipe? Um, and, uh, and Johnson gives some very good answers <laughs> in this, actually. Uh, that I'm not going to just start listing off. Um, the thing I am going to start listing off is things that I was, uh, highlighting during the course of reading this book. So I'm just going to start flipping to pages that I have notes on, so I'm, I'm back in my notebook. Um, let's see. Um, I want to start actually, based on that, I want to start on this weird series of things. Um, there is this long 
uh, debate that Johnson sort of stages between the, um, the, the I guess, play theorist, D.W. Winnicott, um, somebody whose work I'm not familiar with at all, um, and Mrs. Ooh, what's her name? Uh, this is a, I think this is a British, uh, uh, like, sausage brand of some kind or another. Um, Mrs. Beaton. Uh, who, who I'm not I don't, I'm not familiar with the products um, uh, this, this, is, uh, this isn't part of the thing that I was quoting but this is the chapter consider the sausage uh, in again the advanced reader copy um, uh, it starts with sometimes parenthetically always heroes let you down which is to say after reading D.W. Winnicott's illuminating writing on play I am shocked and appalled to find he is among the people who are fond of declaring I hate recipes shocked and appalled to find his disaffection to be such that he chooses to make cooking from recipes the antithesis of living a playful creative life this is not a good enough analysis for me i am i am compelled to engage with winnicott on the matter um and, and the bulk of the rest of this chapter which i'm going to read sort of like segments that i that i pulled from uh is like is johnson pulling together a an uh, sort of a theoretical argument between winnicott and um and mrs beaton uh, because Winnicott specifically uh, talks about Mrs. Beaton's recipe for sausage as like the again the antithesis of living a playful life, um, and and she goes through it and, and, and yeah and um, yeah so I'm gonna I'm gonna read a, a, a couple of excerpts and, and maybe chip chip in here and there. Um, it's my first one. Winnicott finds cooking from a recipe to be an ideal tool for theorizing because it is co because it is cooking from a recipe in theory. However, a recipe demands translation into praxis and hangs limp if left languishing in theory only. Uh, so this is the sort of first huge salvo. It is to say, um, it is easy to theorize the, um, the stodginess of being a cook who cooks from recipes um, if you are just theorizing about it and not doing it. Uh, because cooking for recipes, as as Johnson has, has talked about extensively throughout this book, and as a, as I now agree with extremely more, uh, based on uh, Johnson's arguments, um, is cooking for recipes is never s as simple as cooking from recipes, right? Um, you cook with the rest, you cook from the recipe with what you have, or you cook from the recipe because you went out to get all the ingredients to cook from the recipe, or you cook from the recipe and something changes, and um, you have to you know, play some jazz in the middle of it, or you cook directly from a recipe and you get exactly what you wanted, which is the least likely of the options. <laughs> um, which is to say, yeah, there has to be a praxis. There's, you can't, you can't simply say, uh, I'm theorizing about cooking from a recipe theoretically. Uh, that's, uh, that is a, a dereliction of the, the realities of, of cooking. Um, which I, I tend to agree with. Um, and so the next one I pulled on page 127, this is in a weird little section um, where uh, Johnson has uh, has tried cooking this Mrs. Beaton recipe that Winnicott uh, mocks um, and so and then writes the, the, the text as, as, as is shown on the screen at the moment um, because um, she uh, scrawled notes and wanted to sort of like um, replicate how that looked. Um, um, I thought of his account of cooking sausages without a recipe as if for the first time, but she, he could only cook the sausages at all because other recipes were floating in the air because of an, because an imagination of a recipe is present. Um, it's also a strong argument to me. Um, you know, like I said, I'm a person who, when when trying to, like, figure out how to cook a new thing, I will read a handful of recipes of it, um, and then I will often, you know, go go my own way. What I am doing is reading recipes. What I am doing is is working with the sort of institutional knowledge I have of how certain things work together. Not always, but extremely often, based on other recipes that I've cooked, um, or other recipes that I've um, amalgamated and cooked in some way or another. Um, and so this is a this is not just an argument that like cooking from a recipe is good. It is an argument that is a fundamentally deeper argument that cooking from a recipe is inevitable in some way. Which is fascinating. Um, 
got one just a couple pages later. Um, uh, after I cook the sausages, I am more in disagreement with Winnicott than before. His account of cooking from the recipe reduces the experience to a thin linguistic apparition. Cooking does not take place in the medium of language. In his haste to theorize, Winnicott mistakes the recipe text on the printed page for the act of cooking the recipe, which is like, fuck you. Yes, let's go. <laughs> um, um, you know, maybe I've read too much Derrida, um, but that one, that one hits for me. Um, so jumping ahead, uh, Winnicott misses the insight that the recipe can restore the body to language when they are adrift from one another, and that this return will be different each time it is repeated. Speaking of reading too much Derrida, let's go. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, <laughs> shit is exciting to me. Um, restore the body to language, right? Um, the recipe is a written object, which requires a person to enact it and, and results in the nourishing of that person. Language is, is specifically used to mediate the body here, but the body is specifically used to mediate language because you can't do the part where you nourish yourself from reading the recipe. You can do it from cooking the recipe and then eating it. Um, and that this return will be different each time it's repeated? Come on. Come on. Difference, baby. Um, in pra practical difference. So good. It's so good. Um, and, and then the final um, thing I have from this sort of, uh, again, this sort of constructed argument between Beaton and, and, uh, uh, and John, or, and uh, Winnicott, or the, rather the argument that, that Johnson is having with Winnicott via the argument Winnicott had, or the diss Winnicott had for uh, Beaton. Um, Actually, I think that one, the last one, was the last one. Um, I think this one will require too much uh, context, and I'm happy with where I got to. Um, yeah, this this is just fun. Um, this one, this is a, there's another quote. Um, this is just a good one. Um, there's a there's a recurring discussion of the Odyssey. One of one of uh, Johnson's sort of um, rhetorical moves throughout the book is to talk about how uh, a recipe is an epic without a hero. Um, and, and some part of that is talking about the Odyssey repeatedly. Uh, this is just a good, this, I just love this. Uh, in a contemporary Odyssey, most people are blown from place to place, not by the wrath of gods, but by landlords. Landlords can sell the place you are living in, even if you have only just moved in or raise the rent above what you can pay. Landlords are rarely met in person by those whose lives they impact so profoundly. Tenants may experience moldy walls, poor ventilation, cockroaches, rats, mice, minuscule rooms, and deposit theft. A landlord may never set foot in a home they own, which for them is not a place to live. Fuck landlords. Uh, okay. I think that's what I want to end on. So um, I'm going to do two more, and then I'm going to do the one I'm going to end on. So we're going to flip over here. Do, do, do. Uh, I wrote a note in this one. I didn't write a lot of notes in this. Just uh, just two, in fact. Uh, this one and the one I want to end on. Uh, my note here, I love this. So often cooking is so insular, remaining at the level of metaphor rather than engaging with other productive arts. This is a short quote. The experimental hairdresser is an intense East Londoner in her 40s and deeply focused on her art. My hair becomes the, the medium with which she works to produce a new cut, a new dish. Um... I love the this little it's just a small moment of solidarity of, of recognizing the ways that um, repetitive labor that produces as an aesthetic object, um, whether that aesthetic is, is one of taste or, or vision, um, is one of <laughs> sensation, um, is, is is can be irrelevant in, in certain um, aspects, and even if if it's the differences are relevant that there is a that there is a material solidarity there um just made me happy to read that uh even earlier in the book this is the first thing i, I uh 
quoted, um, the choice is not between burning the, down the kitchen or revisiting it in a nostalgic dream state. That is a false binary. It is bad faith to burn your grandmother's archive because she wasn't as free as you. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I've, I, you know, I, I talked to Derrida or whatever, but like, um, you know, there's like Susan Sontag in here. There's Adorno and Horkheimer. Um, there's a ton of Nigella Lawson, actually. This is, I think, the first thing that's ever made me want to explore Nigella Lawson's work. Not that I've ever, like, been explicitly dismissive of it or, or, or like, disliked it. I just, I don't know. She's just one of those names who I'm like, I, I'll get there someday. Um, and reading this book, I was like, maybe that day is sooner than later. Um, in my head, I also think MFK Fisher is kind of in that category at this point, but I don't know why. I don't think she really comes up in this book at all. Um, but yeah, uh, so the thing I want to end on is on page 116 in this advanced reader copy. And this is a book club just for bees, so if you're not a bee, you're not allowed to be watching this. Um, my note to this. Hold on. Simply reads, this is all I think about. And then I circled a paragraph. Members of the ensemble vary the order in which aspects of the dish are eaten and the way they are cut up, or not, the things that are eaten, the speed at which eating takes place, fast or slow, and its impact on the temperature of the food, the music that is playing while the eating performance takes place, and how music encourages people to eat in time with its rhythm or to talk loudly while eating, pieces of food that are shared with someone else, and how, the parts of a plate that each person lingers over. Alternatively, there is total refusal, and eating none of it. Silence. A tacit performance. I think so much about how eating is important. And there are a lot of reasons for that, um, some of which I don't really want to get into. Um, the major of which that I do want to get into is, you know, I, I am... Uh, I have maybe not been as good as an organizer of this in the past little while, but, like, I... I one of the things that is nearest and dearest to my heart is having helped run um, a monthly sort of uh, chosen family potluck um, for the last four and a half years at this point, almost, something like that, like closing it on five. Like, a thing that we, has made it through impossible, impossible circumstances. Um, brutal friend breakups. Um, you know, the general busyness of life, um, you know, kids being born, um, people people moving away, all these things, um, and all that was before COVID. Um, and we managed to make it work through, you know, through deliveries, um, through, through distance, through mask times, um, through... Uh, continued deep uncertainty and terror um, and all of this stuff. And and for me, the theoretical foundation of that project, that, that life-giving thing that, that some folks and I have managed to keep alive for this long, um, my, my, like, my, my slogan version of it has always been, Eating is contributing. Because it's very easy if you have a thing that's like a potluck thing among, like, you know, fucking family, basically. Um, like, chosen family. Genuine family. People who you choose to love every day. Um, it's very easy to, to see that happening and to see yourself and go, well, I guess I'll just skip this month because, you know, I just don't, you know, I... I'll be working all, the, all day that Saturday and then I won't have any time to make something or um, I will, you know, I just couldn't afford enough groceries <laughs> to be able to like make something for other people and also eat myself, um, you know, over the next week um, or just, just don't want to. Um, and, and it became incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important to me to say eating is contributing because it's fucking true. 
thinking about the way that people cook is extremely important. One of the reasons that I've mentioned that I've been so happy with things like Small Fires by Rebecca May Johnson and, and Nourishing Resistance by uh, edited by Renner Rye um, is because so much food media that I have consumed, that I have learned so much from, that I have uh, have engaged with critically in, in, in different forms, um, have, have cooked from, uh, ends their engagement with the actual world of eating with a with an mmm so good on camera or a buy local wink save the world i guess uh check out your local farmer's market that sort of thing the engagement with eating the, the practice of eating the reality of eating is so fucking absent from food media that i know whatever you know, I, I think I think there's, you know, there's a version of me 10 years ago who would have, you know, tried to pitch a paper about mukbang as uh, as, as revolutionary practice um, and gotten paid $30 for it or whatever. Um, I've been proud of what I wrote, but kind of embarrassed also later on. Um, I, th I think there, which is to say, not that that's just like a simply embarrassing take, but that there, there are... There are other things happening than the things I am specifically focused on and, and thinking about. Um, but to see this moment, to see Johnson, who is so meticulous about talking about cooking, about thinking about the ways that recipes are used and thought about and ignored, um, to also take these moments to, to notice that the total refusal and eating none of it is itself a silent and tacit performance is like such a powerful thing because i don't think that's to say exclusively i think johnson's careful with her words here right you could take um eating none of it silence a tacit performance as like a refusal as um as snobbery as um um picky pickiness uh, or as uh a, a, you know a judgment um and i don't think those words are here because I don't think those are the only possibilities in, in caged within this argument. Um, I think I think there's so many reasons a person doesn't eat, or a person eats noisily, or a person eats uh, carefully in one setting, or loudly in another, or doesn't eat in one setting and doesn't in another. I think this book, and especially this this little paragraph at least for me, managed to unlock those feelings that I feel when I have to say eating is contributing to people who I dearly love and who I want to fucking eat some dope food that I made for them, even if I'm not going to eat it, because listen, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I make my own silent, tacit performance. Um... I have like four more notes in here that I would like also still want to talk about, even though I said I was going to end here because this is all fucking extemporaneous. Um, but yeah, I think, I think this book was extremely special. Um, I kind of want to, it's like part of me that's just like, maybe I'll just reread this like immediately with the eating is not contributing thing in like forefront of my mind and see if I can't just like sort of help myself theorize that even further. Anyway, like it's that, it's that kind of book. And I love that kind of book. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Small Fires, an epic in the kitchen by Rebecca Mae Johnson. Thanks for not watching.